Bibles to Psalm 5, and let's look at a prayer of David. Uh, we're not only going to learn about mostly the important part, the content of the prayer, but he also teaches us some things about prayer as well as we go through this that answer some questions that we might have in our hearts about things that we need to pray for and, and how to pray. But that being said, uh, let me read Psalm 5, and then we'll turn to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to be back and forth between the ESV and the NASB tonight. Um, there's a word one of them uses that I like, and then the NASB uses a couple of phrases that I like better. So uh, I'll be back and forth. So if you're confused, I'm sorry. I'm just between the two versions here. I'll begin in the ESV and read Psalm chapter 5, or Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning, give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare or order my prayer and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord hates or abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your chesed or loving kindness, I will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance, that's the second time we've used this, the abundance of their transgressions cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together again. Uh, thank you for these few that have gathered, um, Father, to worship you corporately, collectively, Father. Uh, Lord, we are so thankful that we have experienced your loving kindness. We're so thankful that you have opened our eyes and our hearts to the truth of the gospel. You've brought us to saving faith, Father. You worked in such a way to bring about repentance and, and belief in our hearts and our lives, Father. And then you have continued to pour out your blessings upon us, Father, through Christ. And Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, so thankful for your word. I have no idea what in the world we would do without it. Uh, Lord, let us treasure it. Let us pour our minds and our hearts into understanding it and then our lives into believing and obeying it, Father. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would help us tonight as we consider uh, David's words through the work of the Spirit to pen Psalm 5, Father, help us to learn to live in light of the truth that we find here. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the entire psalm, it's interesting if you'll notice verse 1 is actually not verse 1, just like we said uh, the last time we were in Psalm 4. If you'll notice back in Psalm 4, it begins with, to the choir master with stringed instruments. And then chapter 5 begins with, to the choir master for the flutes. Probably not flutes, probably wind instruments. So it's a different word. It's interesting to look in the Hebrew. It's really close. Not even going to try to pronounce it. But most people believe that Psalm 4, it says for the string. And then Psalms 5, it says for the wind, the wind instruments. So this is a song that they sang. It's also a prayer request of David. And it's interesting because there's only three requests. You've got 12 verses, uh, didn't count the words. You've got 12 verses, but you only have three requests in here. And obviously, the most significant one, the most striking one, 
comes in verse 8, which is the first request. So he, lo- he rolls through seven verses, if you will, in his prayer, leading up to the point that he makes his first request, and it's for righteousness. So if you're going to title this, which the ESV does, and I think they hit the nail on the head, it's a prayer that God might lead us in righteousness. And we're back to the most important truth of the Christian faith. We need to live godly lives. And we talk about that a whole lot. Uh, I was, went back and, and read through uh, Paul's words to Timothy about his preaching. The only preaching that's worth anything is the preaching that promotes godliness, godly living. That's the only kind of significant preaching. And we've talked about 2 Peter, we may jump there in a little while, where Peter points to the fact that we have responsibility in pursuing godliness. But here we have David pleading with the Lord for godliness or righteousness. And so we've got to take these words to heart as well and learn uh, how we pursue righteousness through prayer. But nonetheless, look back at, at verse, five, or verse 1, rather, chapter 5. Look at all the words that he uses to describe what he's saying. Verse 1, my words, my groaning. Verse 2, my cry. Verse 3, my voice. And so David's using a whole lot of words to stack up this truth, I think. This is a very heartfelt prayer. He's pouring himself out to this prayer that he's struggling to find the words. In fact... Uh, Verse 1, my groaning, they're not even words. He's just praying, if you will, I hate to say this, but I think you'll understand how I mean this. He's praying in the Spirit, if you will, in His Spirit. That He's not even able to find the right words to communicate to God, but He knows that the Spirit of God understands very clearly what He's saying. And we've all been there. I mean, we've all been on our face before God, unable to find words, and wept or groaned or mumbled, or just sat silently allowing our soul to communicate to the Lord what's going on. So we've all been there. I just don't want you to miss David is there. He's at that point in the prayer where he's, even his words is difficult in finding them, but he's, he's totally okay with that because he knows that the Spirit of God understands his spirit within him and the desires of his heart. So it's very heartfelt. Now, the reason that David is so certain that God's going to understand him comes with, look in verse 2, my king and my God. That in this first section, and I'll describe the sections for you as we go along, is the most important words or phrase that we find in verses 1, 2, and 3. My king and my God. We're automatically reminded that the Lord doesn't hear those who don't belong to him But we're also reminded that for those who belong to him, the Lord hears. And David bases, if you will, this prayer on the reality that he has a relationship. He's in covenant relationship with God. You are my king personal. You are my God personally. Lord, we have a relationship and there I'm pouring out my heart to you. I'm not going to pause there long, but as you read back through this in your quiet time, this evening or tomorrow, that's worth giving a lot of thought about and that's worth praising God over. You have a personal relationship with a God who spoke everything into creation. That's mind-boggling when I just sat there and thought on that. I can call you my God and you're the same God who has no beginning and no end. You're the same God who spoke everything into existence and I have a relationship with you. That's crazy, okay? But nonetheless, it gives David absolute confidence that his words and his groaning and his voice and his sound, if you will, the Lord will hear him. For to you do I pray. Verse 3, O Lord, in the morning, he gives us the time, which we've been back and forth between morning and evening, right? But this is significant because in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning, okay, here's where we have a little bit of difficulty. I prepare a sacrifice for you, the ESV says, and watch. The NASB says, I will order my prayer to you. I think there, the word struggle there is sacrifice or prayer. Okay? The ESV guesses prayer. I mean, the ESV guesses sacrifice. And the NASB puts down prayer because they're all struggling with what do we do with the word prepare or the word order. 
The ESV says, since we're preparing something, obviously he's talking about a sacrifice, which you could translate it that way. The NASB says, oh no, we've been talking about prayer since we started. We haven't gotten away from prayer. Now he's ordering or he's arranging his prayer. That's where I am. I don't like the word order. I like the word prepare, but it doesn't change it to sacrifice for me. It stays in prayer, which means this. David spent time ordering or preparing his prayer before he prayed. Think about that. I don't know whether he did it with a pen and a scroll. I don't know if he arranged his prayer in his mind and considered it long himself of how do I need to best communicate this to God. I don't know, but it is clear that he spent time preparing before he prayed. I think about this. Paisley's got a friend, Beth, that writes all of her prayers down in her journal rather than just, you know, doing what she does. She gets out her journal and begins writing to the Lord. And I've read some of them. She let us read some of them back when we went to Centerpoint. And I'm like, that is amazing, Beth. She said, I've just grown so much in my prayer life. And I was like, yeah, I can tell you're taking time to order your thoughts to God. That's really good. I want to encourage you to do that as well. Sometime make time to sit down and rather than words coming out of your mouth with your eyes closed, spend time to write those words down and arrange your thoughts and request to God. That's what David has done here. He has ordered his prayer. He has prepared his prayer in the morning, in the first part of the day, and then he watches and waits, which is another significant truth. He's in full expectation that God's going to answer his prayer. And that we likewise need to pray with that sort of confidence in the Lord. But that expresses faith to God. That's not weird. To make our requests known to God, of course, the request that David makes is like the most holy, God-centered, in line with God will prayer request that you can make. Lord, lead me in righteousness. <laughs> you don't have to worry about being outside of God's will to pray that. But nonetheless... He gets up in the morning, he orders his prayer, he spends time in prayer to God, and then he watches and waits the Lord fulfill this prayer, okay? If you will, in short, in immediate. This is not, Lord, save my family member, and then we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. That's not the picture here. He, he prays and he expects an immediate moving of the hand of God. And I would too. For this request, without question. In fact, I would expect God to begin arranging my day immediately in order that He might lead me in righteousness and begin sovereignly making the adjustments, if you will, through today to lead me out of unrighteousness and help me to walk in a way that pleases Him. This is such an extraordinary prayer that you could confidently order it, pray it, and watch, and watch it happen. Now, he begins a basis for his request before we get to the request. And the basis for his pleading with the Lord for righteousness is the fact that God hates unrighteousness. So in 4, 5, and 6, we learn about God. And we learn something about God that's not preached very often at all. You've heard it from me. You've heard it from this pulpit, from other men. And it's eternally true. It's just not accepted much today. Here's the truth. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. Those are people. He didn't just say God hates the sin but loves the sinner. He just said God hates sinners. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors or hates the bloodthirsty and the liar or the deceitful man. So before he gets to his prayer request for righteousness, he reminds himself and he responds to God in prayer by saying, Lord, you absolutely hate all unrighteousness. You hate all wickedness. You hate sin. You hate sinners. People who have rebelled against God, rejected, against, rejected God, and walk in the ways of their own flesh and their own desires, God hates. Now, you know, I made the mistake of um, listening to a few sermons over the last couple of weeks. Um, 
One of those was at Passion in Atlanta. And it was on the love of God. And it was God loves you and God's for you. And it's, I guess they probably, I'm guessing because I could only watch like five minutes of it before I had to turn it off. I'm guessing they sang that new song. I, we were, some of us were talking about it recently. They start out, um, what's her name, Abby? Huh? Carrie Job. Carrie Job and crazy preacher. Uh, Stephen Furtick wrote a song. Started out quoting scripture, and then it ends with 500 verses of God loves you, God's for you. Okay? Now, I don't have a problem with God loves you, God's for you, if I'm speaking to God's people. You can't stand up in front of an auditorium of 10,000 people and make that statement because God doesn't love all of you and God's not for you because you're living in open, unrepentant rebellion against God. I can't say that because there are other passages in the Bible that say God hates all evildoers. So I can't comfort you in your rebellion and your sin. I'm lying to you. If you continue your path, you're going to spend eternity in hell. God doesn't love you up until the day you die and then throw you into hell. That would be weird. If you walk in open and unrepentant, immoral behavior and sin, this text says the Lord hates all evildoers. Now, I know hopefully in your mind you go, yeah, but what about John 3, 16? Well, that is true as well. For God so loved the created order. What's involved in the created order? Everything and everybody? Yes. God does have a love for everything and everyone He's ever created. There is a love there. But that also has to be balanced with there is a hatred that God has for evil, wicked, rebellious sinners. And He's going to pour out that hatred for all eternity. This is a truth about God. Now, hopefully that changes how much you love your pet sin. Hopefully that thing that we all struggle with that's in your heart, in your mind right now, hopefully you're being reminded that God hates that. God absolutely abhors that. He doesn't tossle our hair like we're little boys and go, well, it's okay. I know you're struggling with it. No. God hates it a whole lot more than I hate my own pet sins. In fact, I often confess that to God and I go, I know you hate this about me and I want you to grow my own hatred for this about me. And he has. I ask him to take away all joy, all satisfaction, any peace, anything that it might bring me that fulfills the flesh, replace every ounce of that with hatred. So that if I ever do fall into it or participate in any of these things, let me be filled with a hatred toward that attitude and that action. When I reject you, rebel you, work some way against your word, may my heart be filled with anger for my actions. And let me walk in repentance. So before David gets to the request for the righteousness, that God would lead him in righteousness, he prefaces that with a reminder for himself that God hates wickedness. He absolutely hate wickedness. All right. Verse 7. But I will enter your house. Now, there's two modifying prepositional phrases here. How in the world does David know he will enter his house? How in the world does David know that he's experienced... Saving faith. What are the prepositional phrases that modify David's thought that gives him confidence that he's going to enter the house of God? What is it? Through the abundance of your loving kindness. Nothing David has done. David is confident that he's going to spend eternity in the presence of God based on the love of God. Based on the fact that God has shed His love on David. Therefore, David knows that he's going to experience eternity with God. 
He doesn't say, but I, through my work, will enter your house. But I, through my repentance and faith, will enter your house. But I, through my praying the sinner's prayer, or praying the sinner's prayer, will enter your house. It's just simply this. I, through the abundance of your loving kindness, that's the one translation in the ESV. I'm like, come on, guys, you totally missed that. I, through the abundance of your loving kindness, will enter your house. We talked about this word tons of times. Psalms 103 is all about it. The chesed of God, C-H-E-S-E-D. Y'all remember that word? I'm pretty convinced that that's God's favorite word to describe himself. He is full. Remember he told Moses, I am full of loving kindness. And David knows that he's experienced the loving kindness of God. And he says, I will enter his house based on his loving kindness. Not only will he enter his house, look what he says, I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. In holy, reverent fearfulness, David will fall before God and worship him. All because God has shed abroad his abundant loving kindness on David. Another place for you to stop and pause this week and be thankful to God for. You'll spend eternity in the presence of God because of His abundant loving kindness. You will experience eternal joy and peace. Everything you ever desired, everything will be fulfilled because God has been abundant in His loving kindness toward you. So, all that prefaces David's first request. And David's request is, verse 8, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Now, I said we would do this. So let's go to two different places. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll go ahead and find the second one. Uh, da, da, da. Second Peter chapter 1. So go to Ephesians 4. And then when you find that, put something there. Head on over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Put something there. And y'all look at me when you get there, and I know you're there. Anybody want Ephesians, an Ephesians question? Rob, you want the Ephesians question? <laughs> What's, what, what's, the, uh, what's the first word of instruction or exhortation in Ephesians? Okay. Don't be technical, though. <laughs> yeah, which comes where? Where does it come? There you go. So look at 4.1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy, talking about walking in godliness, walking in holiness. What does he base the exhortation on? Anybody remember? Don't say one through three, because technically you'd be right, but be a little more specific than that. How about the prayer request immediately before the exhortation? So how in the world... Can Paul tell us to walk in a manner that pleases the Lord? Rob. Repeat the question. So Paul makes the exhortation in chapter 4, 1, walk. Right. How can he say that? Thank you. Look back up in verse 20 of chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy. So in other words, before the exhortation to holiness comes, Paul prays that God might, according to the power at work within us, right? That we would experience the power at work within us. Now go walk. So turn to 2 Peter. Who wants the 2 Peter question? Sarah, 
No. What's the first exhortation without being too technical in 1 Peter? What verse is it? 1-5. One five. One five. Look at 2 Peter 1-5. For this very reason, you, yourself, that's the verb choice, make every single effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. How can he make that statement, you yourself do this? Well, what does he say immediately before he says that? Verse 3, what does that say? His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory, by which He granted to us precious and very great promises so that through them you can become the partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of the sinful desire for this very reason. Again, power precedes the exhortation. Okay? but you have responsibility. And when we talked about 2 Peter, I put, very, I put a lot of emphasis, rather, on your responsibility to pursue godliness. Okay? You yourself need to do this. But what do we find in Psalm 5? Go back to Psalm 5. Psalm 5, verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. So you need to understand the balance of that. You need to understand how those two things work together to work godliness and righteousness in your heart and life. Here we have David pleading with the Lord. Go back up to verse 1. Give ear to my words. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. Lead me in your righteousness. So you have a responsibility to pursue righteousness but you also have a responsibility to pour your heart out to God that He might work righteousness in your life. Let me ask you something. Have you found yourself weeping over your sin, asking God to work righteousness and godliness in you and to help you stop? Anybody? Man, if you do that, that is a wonderful sign that you've been born again. Unregenerate people never do that. Regenerate people often do that. They plead and beg God to relieve them of their sin and to help them walk in a way that pleases God. Let me tell you something. If you're going to pour your heart out over anything, don't wait till there's sickness. Don't wait till there's death. Pour your heart out to God over your own sin and pour your heart out to God that He might lead you in a way that's better, that's higher, that's holy. That's definitely something to weep over and to be broken over. And I think David is here. Consider my groaning is not even words. He's absolutely melting that God might lead him in a way that is righteous. Now, why? Why is it that David is struggling with unrighteousness? Now, if you didn't look, why do you think David would be struggling with unrighteousness? What would you say? What would you say, Jordan, if you're cheating and reading the next verse? <laughs> if I told you David's struggling with unrighteousness, what would be your reason for that? Why is he struggling with unrighteousness? Big theological answer, not detail. Well, let me ask you, why do you struggle with unrighteousness? We don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> What's the theological answer? Sin. Yes. Okay, What's wrong with our hearts? We're fallen. We're filled with sin. Therefore, I struggle with unrighteousness at times. Is that the reason David gives of unrighteousness right here in this text? What's the very next part of the verse say? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Look, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of what? 
my enemies. That's interesting and a little bit relieving. But now you got two problems. Not only do you have unrighteousness because of your own fallen nature that you struggle with, but now you have unrighteousness to worry about because you have somebody that's working against you, your enemies. And so this is the reason for David's prayer. It's not because he's wrestling in his own self with his own fallen sinful nature, which we all know David had and wrestled with, but David is pouring out his heart to God to lead him in righteousness because of his enemies trying to lead him in unrighteousness. Okay? And how they lead him in unrighteousness is one of the most important things in this psalm. All right? So look at verse 8, the first prayer request. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Verse 9 tells us how they're affecting David with unrighteousness. How is that? With their mouth, with their words. Notice verse 9. There's no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Now when you put the mouth, the throat, and the tongue together, what are they doing to lead David in unrighteousness? Speaking. Their words. Their words are affecting David and leading him away from righteousness. Knowing the New Testament, what's the most significant way the enemy works to lead us away from righteousness? False teaching. teaching. We're back to it. Turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 20. Let's see, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Um, Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus and he's leaving. Acts 20, verse 28. You there? All right, here we go. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. I know after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among yourselves men will arise speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So Paul already knows this. As he's leaving the church at Ephesus, he's poured two years of his life into this. He's saying his goodbyes before he heads off to Rome. And he says, guys, you, you, you better knuckle down here and pay attention because there's going to be guys that are coming in. They're going to speak twisted things to draw away from righteousness. They're going to use their mouth, their tongue, their throat. And they're going to fill you with false truth, lies, and they're going to lead you astray. It, it's not just Paul... Go to 2 Peter again. Should have had you mark that, my bad. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. There it is again. There are no new tricks in the bag. It's always the same thing. On your way back to Psalm 5, stop off at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. 2 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, look with me at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take thought, or we take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's it. That's how the enemy attacks and that's how we resist the enemy because we take every thought captive and make it obedient, put it up under the teachings of Christ to see whether or not it's true. David's praying this, right? But oh, what a mess we find ourselves in today. Think about the church today. All the craziness that's going on is a direct result of all the foolish words that came from the throat, the tongue, the mouth of the enemy. And we believed it. So really, David does this preceding prayer, but you and I do this prayer as if we're in the midst of it. We have been led astray. We have been led astray by that which is not truth. We have been led astray by the open grave, and we have been led astray by the flattering tongue. Now we're asking God, God, show us where all that we have been led astray. Immediately comes to mind where the most significant thing that's impacted the church is sexual immorality and how it's being swept up in the church is something that's okay. It'll never be okay. Countless other things, but this is how it happens. If you want to know why the church is crazy, so much that's going on is simply because of David's prayer here, they've believed that which is not true. And they took hold of it. So back to verse 8, David is begging God, pouring his heart out to God to lead him in righteousness because he knows how his enemy works. He wants to change the way that you think. And he wants to move you away from the Word of God and move you into lies and untruth, something that pleases the flesh. Now, the last two requests are uh, pretty interesting. Verse 10, David prays that God would move on behalf of those who have led the people of God in unrighteousness. Look at verse 10. Second prayer request. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel, Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. David is praying that God would pour out his wrath on all those who've led the church astray. We probably don't pray like that very often, but we should. We should pray that God would pour out his wrath, he should catch them, he should make them bear their guilt all those who have led the church astray with their lying tongue. That's amazing. In fact, I was trying to think of a time where Paul gets really close to that. And I think there are a couple of times. Um, One of those, you don't have to turn there. Uh, I have you all over the place. But one of those kind of appears in 2 Timothy. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. But in the last chapter... Chapter 4, 2 Timothy, this is what Paul says to Timothy. He says, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself. In other words, it's very similar to what we see in Psalms 5. The Lord's going to pay him back for the harm that he did to me in the gospel. Interesting. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own wicked counsel. And you know what they will? David's praying, obviously, in the will of God here, or for the will of God. But we need to understand, all those who have brought in, I'll go back to sexual immorality, those who have brought homosexuality and sexual immorality into the church as an alternative lifestyle, that you can be Christian and be homosexual at the same time, all those people are going to fall by their own wicked counsel. All that's going to unravel because of the wisdom and the design of God. Okay? 
They can't stand in that lie. But nonetheless, God, or, or rather David prays to God that God would make them bear that guilt for doing what they've done. Look at verse 11. He goes from praying for that God would pour his wrath out on the wicked. Now he prays that God would pour out joy on all those who belong to him. Verse 11, but. So we go from verse 10, make them bear their guilt, O God, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. So for the wicked, for those who have poured out lies and led in unrighteousness, he prays for the wrath of God. But in verse 11, he prays for those who pursue righteousness that God would pour out joy on them. That's really good for us. Will believers experience eternal joy? Yes. And here we find David praying for that very thing. It's the very same thing. God, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult, not in themselves, but back into you. God is the center of David's prayer request. Now here's the thing, before we go on to verse 12. Can anyone think of a passage, I'm thinking of one in Philippians 2. Can anyone think of a passage where we have the promise that God is going to make us righteous? That God is working righteousness in our lives? What passage am I thinking about in Philippians 2? For God works where? In you to will and to work according to His good purpose. Philippians 2.13, right? So is it God's will and is it God's design and is God working righteousness in the life of the believer? Is he doing that? Say yes. Is David praying for that? Yes. Is God bringing about, working about the wrath of all the unrighteous? Yes. Is David praying for that? Yes. Is God working the ultimate joy for you eternally? Yes. Is David praying for that? Yes. What do we learn about prayer? If God's sovereign, should we pray? Yes. Because our prayer is a participation in what God is already doing. How incredibly awesome is that? You're praying that God would do the very things that He's promised to do. You're praying with the mind of God. You're praying in the will of God. You're praying along with the sovereignty of God. That's awesome prayer requests. That's definitely worth spending your time praying. God, lead me in righteousness. He doesn't say, I am. Why are you praying? He invites us to pray for those things. We don't have to pray that God would destroy the wicked and pour out His wrath. He's going to do those things. Yet, we're instructed in Scripture to pray for those things. Again, God is bringing about our ultimate eternal joy. Should we pray for those things? Yes, absolutely. Because we're participating in the very things that God is doing as we pray in those things. Last verse, look at verse 12. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. God blesses the righteous. I read that, immediately thought of Psalms 1. Because we've got David praying that God would pour out his, or his wrath, make them bear their guilt, O God. We've got him praying on the wicked, and so we understand the wrath of God on the wicked. And then in verse 12 is a statement. It's not a prayer request. You bless the righteous, O God. You pour out blessing on the righteous, and we know that through Christ. But go back and look at Psalm 1. Because Psalm 5 and Psalm 1 really have so much in relationship to one another. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight, the blessed man, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. 
That man is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that it does, he prospers. The wicked, not so. No, the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows intimately, personally, the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. David's Psalm 5 reminds us of David's Psalm 1. There's only two paths. There's no more than that. There's the way of the wicked, and there is the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous will experience eternal blessing of God, even now. And the way of the wicked will experience eternal cursing from God, sometimes, even now. We have to be careful that we're walking in the way of the righteous. And one way to be certain that you are is that you're praying that God would lead you in righteousness. Any questions? Any comments?